In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's a joy to be back to Massachusetts, back to the United States, after a, uh, a global mass circuit. And I want to remind you and encourage you, little little uh, flock here in Massachusetts, you're far from alone. Many, many good traditional Catholics throughout the world that I've seen in Australia, New Zealand, England, Ireland, just a few handful of fighters here and there. And it's not a time of great big Catholic, beautiful parishes and huge seminaries and huge convents with bishops doing their duty, a pope with his head on straight, and uh, many, many good examples. We just don't live in that age. This is the time God put us in, when many souls are just striving seemingly alone to just persevere the faith, persevere in the life of grace, keeping the commandments when everybody else is, is running to hell. Fast forward. And so remember, we are part of the communion of saints. We belong to an army. An army in heaven that's already there praying for us, interceding for us, and are really always ready to help us, especially our guardian angels and all the saints. Pray to the saints. They lived on earth. Many of them lived in times like us, that where people are quite isolated and don't have Mass that often. And even in the good old days before Vatican II, so to speak, so to speak. Yeah. But in the so-called good old days before Vatican II, there were many people on the outskirts of in Alaska, in the higher ranks of Canada, and in, and in the Wild West, who never saw a priest maybe once a year, yeah. if lucky. So in some ways it's not so extraordinary, in some ways it is. But what makes our times extraordinary is the extraordinary wickedness of our days. The return to Sodom and Gomorrah, the return to the times of evil as it was before the flood. So we must follow and imitate these just men, these holy and good souls before us. Now, uh, and also, of course, pray for each other. Pray for each other, all of you here on earth, throughout the world, trying to preserve the Catholic faith of tradition and just hold the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. Oh, yeah. And to hold Archbishop Lefebvre's line is not so much him, as I always say. Oh. It's not so much him, although he is such a holy soul and a great champion of the faith. When I, before I left uh, London yesterday, I, I, I went to the hospital and visited an old lady who's in the hospital. She's 90 years old, 90-something, and she was there when Archbishop Lefebvre first came to England. She was at the Mass, she was, she was there, and she's very disappointed with things now because many times the priests are called upon in the, among the priests of Archbishop Lefebvre and they're being told now in the new SSPX quite often, is she a parishioner? No, but could you call and anoint her? She's dying. Well, if she's not a parishioner, I, I can't go. And this is happening more and more. Why? Because it's all part of this coming under the jurisdiction of the local diocesan bishops. It's all part of this agreement with Rome, where you have your jurisdiction and that's it. And that's good in normal times because there never was a shortage of priests so much before. So priests did have their, their jurisdiction of their parish. But in these days, we're in extraordinary circumstances. They got to go way out of the boundaries of their own jurisdiction or wherever their parish or mission is. Archbishop Lefebvre set this example. He went into other bishops' dioceses mm -hmm. to come to the rescue of souls. 
And so this old lady had not yet received the sacraments, and she's she's dying. And of course, many of these good souls are punished because they don't they go to the resistance mass. So they won't go. They, they won't bury them. They won't uh, bring them extreme unction. Mm-hmm. I don't say in every single case because every every there's still some very good priests who will who will stick their neck out, who will drive extra miles to take care of a soul that's not in their so-called jurisdiction. But that is the the trend now. But anyway, when I mentioned to her the name of Archbishop Lefebvre. This old lady's face all lit up, and she said, "I don't understand why this is happening among the in the society in Pius X. Why this is happening?" And well, I just explained to her briefly, because the leadership has abandoned Archbishop Lefebvre. They've abandoned his position. No, no dealing, not even a discussion about canonical recognition, until Rome proclaims our Lord Jesus Christ as King until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. And it's obvious, it's not even close to re- that return right now, with Pope Francis going around pushing the one world government of the Antichrist, pushing the one world religion, extolling idols in the St. Peter's, and just repeating what Pope Benedict XVI did, and what John Paul II did, and Paul VI. It's all this... Vatican II religion, which we oppose, thanks to the Blessed Mother. If any of us do oppose it, it's with her grace. And if we're going to persevere, it's going to be with her grace. So do persevere, but realize you're not alone in this fight. Sometimes uh, many good souls feel so isolated, and they feel like the only ones fighting. And you're alone in the trenches. But actually... You belong to a huge army of saints in heaven who cheer you on, souls in purgatory, who, once they die, see the real picture. For example, John Benari, uh, pray for his soul. He fought valiantly for Catholic tradition for many years, but he never never said a word about the resistance in Catholic family news. He didn't touch it. But now, when he died, he knows. He knows the real picture, and I'm sure if he had another chance, he would absolutely oppose the, the new direction of modernism in the, in the leadership. So, fight on. We must fight on, because God wants this. God wants us fighting seemingly alone, seemingly quite isolated, seemingly not so much sacraments or not so much parish life, not so much good bishops around, but that's how God wants it. And that's just the way it is. And it's not going to change until the Virgin Mary of Fatima is obeyed. So in the meantime, we fight on. Look at little Jacinta. She never wanted to die alone. She was quite a gregarious girl. She loved company. She loved Our Lady. And the last thing a little girl of her age would want to do is die alone. But it was God's will that she died alone in the hospital. I'm sure she didn't die isolated. I'm sure many angels came. And Our Lady herself probably came to take her soul. But these are just strange crosses God sometimes permits. So what do we do in these times? Surround ourselves with the good atmosphere. Firstly, of course, intimate union with God and the Blessed Trinity. Intimate union with our Divine Lord. If you have the joy to have the Blessed Sacrament, that's a joy. If you don't, send your guardian angel. And our Lord, being God, He's everywhere and hears you anywhere, everywhere, anyway. So raise your heart. As soon as you raise your heart to Him, you're right before His throne. You don't have to go through miles of bureaucracy and red tape. He's there and his ear is down ready to listen, as the Psalms say. Because he's a loving father and he takes care of every detail. He takes care of all the insects crawling in the ground and all the fish in the bottom of the sea and all the, the movement of the heavens. So this God loves souls and he made all this and he died 
proving it with his blood on the cross, the love for each soul. So pray and keep a union with him and the Blessed Mother and the saints. And then surround yourselves also at a practical level with good friends, so to speak. If you don't have good friends and good examples, surround yourself with them. And that is, we live in a time when we have availability of very good books, writings of saints, writings of uh, Archbishop Lefebvre and great champions against the, the revolution in the church and liberalism, such as Father Dennis Fahey, Cardinal Pierre Poitier, the Old Angeles magazine before 2012 is dynamite. There's a lot of good in there. And other good publications, Catholic Family News before 2012 also. And even now, sometimes they publish good, good articles. So sometimes you've got to sift through these publications, but choose what's good. Read what's good. And good websites as well. Surround yourself with what's good. Breathe that air as much as you can of what elevates and edifies the soul. So, let's look at a saint of today whose mass is not being said. It's St. Sylvester, an old monk. But let's look at an old, a young saint, St. John Berkman's, whose today is also his feast. St. John Berkman's he was born in 1599 and died in 1621. So he was just a young man when he died, a young Jesuit. And um, there's a lot to say about his life, but I'd like to just bring out one point, which is his whole life was surrounded by such always good example. We don't have that now. That's why I say we've got to substitute, read the good books hear the good audio talks or good websites and i and i do say there are there are actually decent some decent documentaries of saints lives some even decent movies always take the movies kind of with a grain of salt though some of them are can be corny or inaccurate or sentimentalize the supernatural life but if you're aware of that some of these movies can actually be edifying the Italian, there's an Italian group that put out um, a lot of saints' lives, such as St. Anthony, St. John Bosco, St. Um, Rita of Cassia, and other saints' lives done by an Italian group. And they do, a, they do a fairly decent job. And sometimes these can be a help for many souls. But we want to surround ourselves with what is not really there but was for St. John Berkman's. He was born into a devout family. Um, unlike St. Stanislaus Koska and St. Aloysius, he wasn't from a rich, rich family, a noble family, but he was from a, a father who was a hard worker. His father ran a shop, and mm -hmm. his mother was sickly, but he loved his mother and took good care as a son of, uh, of his mother. He used to participate in the parish mystery plays, which was done very much in the high Middle Ages, at the ages of the faith. It was very common in parishes that there would be a theatrical performance. And of course, every year would be the passion play, especially in, in the countries like Spain and in the South American countries, the passion play, which was very vivid. It, it brought to life the passion and they would act it out, and they would practice, and it was very good acting and very good um, performance, you would say, but, but inspiring. So they would have these mystery plays, which was done always throughout the, high, the ages of the faith, and we're looking at the year 1599, so it's towards the end of the Middle Ages for sure, but a lot of these remnants of the ages of faith carried over. So St. John Berkman's would often as a boy, watched these plays. They would do stories of Noah and the Flood, stories of Abraham and Isaac. And he played as Daniel in one play. When he was old enough, he played as Daniel, who defended Susanna when she was being led to the execution. So, and he played himself very well, they say. 
By the time he was 13, his father's affairs had become straightened, a tough time in his business, and there was growing brothers and sisters of his to be considered. So John was told that he must leave school and learn a trade, because he was um, studying at the time. But he, at this time, he was put under pressure, and he said he wanted to be a priest at 13. And at length his father com compromised by sending him as a servant in the household of one of the cathedral canons, Father John Froimont, at Malines, where he could also attend the classes at the Archiepiscopal Seminary. So his father agreed and put him under the care of a priest. So he was always under the influence of these good priests as a boy. And his parish priest that he grew up with and the, the priest that he grew up around in, in, in Italy, he would often go with them on sick calls and bring communion to the old and the dying. And so as a little boy, he would have witnessed many extreme unctions, serving mass early in the morning, visiting the sick. And there's an interesting remark here in his life. The secular canon, Father Froimont, was a different sort of man from the regular canon Emmerich that he knew. And he would take St. John Berkman duck hunting. <laughs> duck hunting and uh, shooting, shooting bow and arrow and even bullets, because by this time gunpowder was already in. And he, this priest taught his dog which was a difficult art to retrieve. So he probably had a golden retriever or something, but he trained his dog to, to once he shot the ducks, he swims out to the pond and brings the duck back dead in his, in his mouth. So this was a, quite a addition to the characters he grew up around with St. John Berkman's upbringing. And then he would go in 1615, he went to the Jesuits College in Malines, and he was the f one of the first to enter thereat. Not without a good deal of feeling on the part of his former master and rector, on account of which there was a great gulf fixed between them and us, wrote his confessor and tutor in Greek, Father de Grief, G-R-E-E-F-F. -E -F. He studied with earnest application, continued to be an enthusiastic player of sacred dramas, so even in the seminary, they continued a lot of these acting out stories of the scripture or lives of the saints. And sometimes he was found kneeling at the foot of his bed after midnight when asleep, when sleep had overtaken him at his prayers. A year later, after some objection from his father, he joined the novitiate. He wrote home a week before saying, I humbly pray you, honored father and dearest mother, by your parental affection for me and by my filial love for you to be so good as to come here on Wednesday evening at the latest either by the Malines coach from Montagu or by Stephen's wagon so that I may say welcome and also goodbye to you and you to me when you give me your son back to the Lord God who gave me to you. So he wanted to see basically his parents for the last time because he would go to study in Rome. And of course, travel at that time was difficult. So when, when a young man went off to study, they wouldn't see him probably till he was a full-grown priest or, or got his doctorate. So it would mean many years of separation. In the case of St. John Berkman, it, it was... They would never see him again, because he would die young. It was St. John Berkman who said, following the Jesuit rule of life, that he, he was on the conversation struck up at recreation between the clerics. If the end of the world was going to come right now, what would you do? And some of them said, well, boy, I'd run to a priest and make a confession. Another one said, well, I'd run to the chapel and go pray. And St. John Berkman, when they asked him, he, he said, well, they were playing tennis at the time, part of the recreation among the Jesuits. And he said, well, I, I would just keep on playing tennis. Because 
they said, what are you talking about? Why would you do that? If you're going to die, you're going to come before God and, and die with a tennis racket in your hand? And he said, yes, because I'm doing God's will right now. And recreation, when the, whist, when the bell rings, then we go on back to our classes and studies. And, and I would be found doing my father's business, doing God's will. And that's the beautiful thing about seminary life, or convent life, or monastic life. There's all these brothers or sisters who are all pushing each other towards perfection. And that's one of the great things about a real true monastery and true monastic life and seminary life. Everything is ordered to go higher. And St. Bernard says this too in the monastic life. If one of the brothers, because the way to heaven is narrow, the path is narrow, so the brothers, if one brother wants to just slack off and lay down on the trail, so to speak, and give up and not strive for perfection, he's got his other brothers behind him to kick him in the rear, to keep pushing him to go higher. And St. Benedict says that too in his rule, if any brothers are not waking up for the divine office, let the other brothers wake him up and get him going. So that good brotherhood towards perfection is willed by, by God. Christ himself founded the College of the Apostles who helped each other. And they even, there's no doubt, they tried to convert Judas also. St. John Bergman arrived in Rome on New Year's Eve in 1618. And here he would be exposed to other great Jesuit saints. He would have met many saints. And among the ones, he, he, he also, it says here, Father Masucci, the spiritual director of the senior students, declared that, quote, After blessed Aloysius Gonzaga, with whom I lived in the Roman college during the last years of his life, I have never known a young man of more exemplary life, of purer conscience, or of greater perfection than John, John Berkman. So his, his spiritual father knew St. Aloysius, who knew St. Robert Bellarmine. So this is the world that these men grew up with. Oh. And kind of like Archbishop Lefebvre, Archbishop Lefebvre was called the angel of the seminary. Um, not that he was... Uh, had his nose down in everybody, and he was holier than thou, far from it. But he really was an angel. He was an angelic soul. And in any monastic life or seminary life, there's always the more worldly ones who are more, you know, t tend to break the rule, break the silence. So even in the best of seminaries, in the best of monasteries, in the best of convents, when everybody strives to obey the rule, it's always good. But there's always going to be the few that ride on the edge. They're not really striving for perfection. They're a little more worldly. They're worldly concerns. And this is also good. It's good for them because if they were in the world, they would lose their soul. But it's also good for the, the community life because either you could go follow that direction or you can follow... The, the, those who are striving for more perfection. And that's how it is. So St. John Berkman made sure he followed the good example of those striving for perfection. Yeah. And then in conclusion, um, yeah. St. John Berkman's success in his examination on May 1621 caused him to be selected to defend a thesis against all comers in a public debate. Uh, <clears throat> by the strain of prolonged study during the heat of a Roman summer had been too much for him and he began rapidly to fail in his health. So th those Roman summer heats without air conditioning, it's hot and humid. It's, it's Florida, North Carolina weather. He would say that his, one of his biggest penances was community life, yeah. living among the brothers during uh, recreation. It was a penance for him. On August 6th, though feeling unwell, he took a prominent part in a public disputation at the Greek College 
but the next afternoon he had to be sent off to the infirmary. He was cheerful as usual. Father Chapari records there was always a smile playing around his mouth. When he had drunk a peculiarly nasty dose of medicine, he asked the attendant priest to say the grace after meals, as he told the rector that he hoped the death of another Flemish Jesuit in Rome would not cause friction between the two provinces of the Society of Jesus. When the doctor ordered his temples to be bathed with old wine, which was very expensive, with old good wine, he observed that it was lucky such an expensive illness would not last long. This is an interesting detail here. After four days, Father Cornelius Alapide, he's the one that wrote the commentary on the scriptures, Father Cornelius Alapide, the, the great biblical exegete, asked if there was anything more on his conscience to confess. And St. John Berkman said, Nikil omni no, nothing at all. And he received the last sacraments with great devotion. So Father Lapide gave him extreme unction. He lingered two more days. The doctors were at a loss to diagnose what it was that had brought him to such sickness. And he died peacefully on the morning of August 13th, 1621. There was an extraordinary scene at the funeral. Numerous miracles were attributed to St. John Berkman's intercession. And the recognition of his holiness was spread so rapidly that within a few years... Father Botter, a Society of Jesus priest, wrote from Flanders, saying, Though he died in Rome, and but few of his own countrymen knew him by sight, ten of our best engravers have already published his portrait. They, they put out pictures of him, and 24,000 copies had already been handed out. Nevertheless, though his cause was begun in the very year of his death, he was beatified not until 1865, and his canonization in 1888. And St. John Berkman is invoked for mothers who are expecting. So St. John Berkman died around good priests, studied around saintly priests and people, and he grew up in a holy family, he grew up in a Catholic parish with good priests, nuns, monks. This is the... This is the ideal Catholic world, isn't it? Which we're not in. We're not in. So maybe if we lived in these days, we wouldn't be maybe striving. Maybe we would be more, more careless towards God. Because everybody else is being good. Well, don't have to strive as hard. But now we have to. We have to become saints in this time. Or we may not make it. we got to aim high with the bow and arrow, we got to aim above the bullseye. We got to aim high if we're going to make it to heaven today. And uh, fight on with the rosary and the scapular of Our Lady and be very close to her. And fight on in the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. He probably wished he had more fellow bishops to defend the Catholic Church. And all he had was one. And he was across the world in South America, uh, Bishop de Castro Mayor. So Archbishop Lefebvre found himself quite alone. And many of our good people also find themselves quite alone, and priests too. Father Fuchs in Austria, he, he fights on doing many mass circuits in England and, and parts of Hungary and Austria. And um, many good priests in the society, I'm told, who are not happy with the way things are, but don't know what to do or where to go. So pray for them. Pray that Our Lady gives her answers for the priests. And uh, nevertheless, we fight on in the trenches. O Mary conceived without sin. <coughs> o Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.